we should open in prayer because I don't know about y'all, but I need to open in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word and the things you show in it and how you um, you layer so much meaning within the text that it, it can take many lifetimes to mine the riches, the gems that are in your word. And, and we have all eternity to, to learn it and more and, and the meaning of it. And God, I suspect that just as you are boundless, limitless we're going to discover that your word is the same that there's so many riches there that that we'll never comprehend and there are attributes that you have that we can't conceive of so you never told us about them and lord we just look forward to eternity and the sooner the better being taken out of this uh this profane and evil wicked world um we're tired of our own sin. We're tired of the wickedness in the world. Lord, we just want to enjoy eternity with you. So, again, I want to pray even so quickly. Please come, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so we pick up now after, I hope everybody had a, a good Thanksgiving weekend. So we pick up from the previous week, and as promised, we're going to get into... Um, Yet another major passage that I don't believe we're probably going to get through tonight. We can try. Um, Matthew 24 is probably um, the best passage to go into regarding the Olivet Discourse because it seems to be the most complete. It, sh it sure is longer than the, one, the, the account in Luke or the account in Mark. So we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to see if we can unpack that a bit. Um, I know I mentioned that there is much controversy. The whole subject's controversial, right? But there's controversy regarding the Olivet Discourse, and Matthew 24, many insist that um, there is no rapture in that verse, in that verse, in that chapter, there's not a verse that mentions the rapture. Jesus never said anything about the rapture, and he never said anything about being taken away or anything like that. So therefore, the rapture is not in there. And others insist that, no, there's rapture in there because of this wording here and this wording here. So um, we're going to look at this, and, and you can decide for yourself as we, we've kind of been studying too, it's just because a, a word, as we understand the word, like the word rapture, because it's not in our English Bible by that word, a lot of people say, there's not even the rapture in the Bible. It's not in there at all. And then we found out, as this says, um, the rapture is in there, harpazo, and it, the word rapture, though, is in the Latin Vulgate, and it's a different word. Uh, Rapimir, I'm not, I guess that's how you say it, but I am not a, a speaker of Latin unless I'm, you know, pronouncing something that I learned in biology or prescription or something, but that's about the, as close to Latin as I get. It's a dead language, and uh, so that's where the word rapture comes from. That doesn't mean that the concept is not in the Bible at all. We, you know, I frequently like to say the word Bible is not in the Bible. Um, the Trinity is not in the Bible. As a concept, it, it, is, it is. As a doctrine, it is. But the word Trinity is not in the Bible, so we certainly wouldn't say there's no Trinity in the Bible. Um, so those are all kind of straw man arguments, and a straw man argument is something that you erect just so you can knock it down, like a pinata, right? So... Just because a, a word is not in the Bible doesn't mean the concept is not there. So we can, it's perfectly legitimate to apply logic and reason in Scripture, in the text, um, just as we also look at context and the history and who's being spoken to and all those kinds of things. So um, one of the main things that we've 
find in uh, concerning the end time, but in the Olivet Discourse is as in the days of Noah. And um, Jesus likened the end of that uh, period of time, and people will dispute and argue over that. And it, I don't think it necessarily has to be one answer or the other. It can be multiple answers, and they can all be true. Um, we know from Bible prophecy that it's more about pattern than anything, right? We talked about uh, Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes and how that he was spoken of in Daniel, then the actual event happened, but then in this passage, Matthew 24, Jesus mentions the abomination, abomination of desolation again, which is what was applied to Antiochus. But that doesn't mean that there's just the one event because clearly there's some more events happening in the future. So, so we find ourselves, we've gone through the church age and we're in Revelation chapter 4 and in that first verse and we're taking just kind of a pause and I wish I could say it was a b brief pause. I can't talk tonight. I don't know why that is. I think my tongue needs more coffee. Um, but it's, I think it's going to be good to clear the air about the question of rapture and whether it exists or not and what it looks like and so forth, because ostensibly Revelation chapter four, verse one would be where it would happen. So that's why we're going to take a look at it that way. Here's an important thing to understand. A lot of people will sit down with. Um, Matthew 24, and they'll sit down with Luke, and they'll sit down with Mark, and they'll try to harmonize those accounts and make them all as if they were the same event. And, and they aren't. Um, when we look at, see the second paragraph here, prior to this talk, Luke 21 records a talk in the temple during the day of the events to be, be fulfilled 38 laters, 38 years later. I'm really having issues tonight talking. I just washed my tongue and I can't do a thing with it. Uh, 38 years later in the year 70 AD, uh, we have that phrase, but before these things. So he then goes on to list some things that come up to the very end um, and his second coming after that. So. When you get to Luke about chapter 17, Jesus is trekking. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And apparently, some little knots of his disciples were asking him similar questions or the same questions along the way because he said some things that triggered them. And, they're, you know, and they want to know what's going on with the end because Jesus said some cryptic things that they, they couldn't put together because, remember, the scriptures portrayed in the Old Testament two different messiahs, right? There was the Messiah, the king, who was supposed to come and sit on his throne. And there's also a suffering Messiah, though, that we read about in the Old Testament. So they had difficulty reconciling this. So now they're asking, now, what are these things going to be? And they're anxious. Okay, we're on their way to Jerusalem. This must be Jesus is now going to over there and he's going to kick the Romans tails. They're looking forward to that because once again they find themselves enslaved, right? And they're getting tired of this stuff. It's all right, here we go. How's this going to go down, Lord? What's the, going to be the, the end? What's the sign of the end? How do, we, how do we know we're there? And Jesus is sharing these things. So starting Luke 17, we get these little snippets of the same accounts that Jesus, after the temple, in Luke, 20, in Luke 21, where he's inside the temple and he's speaking to the general population, whoever's in there, there's some believers in there because they weren't differentiating, okay, you're, the term Christian wasn't even used yet. Right, so they weren't differentiating, uh, even when Christians were called, they were um, followers of the way in Acts. We weren't even at that point yet. Jesus is just this strange rabbi who had this following. And so they just looked at them as, as Jews. 
Um, there weren't a lot of Gentiles at the time who were followers, and they certainly wouldn't have been in the synagogue. So Jesus is with believers, and he's also with unbelievers, the Pharisees and so forth, and the general population in the synagogue. So he's sharing generally these things, some of which we read about in Matthew 24, but mostly we read about in Luke 21. So what happens is, according to the third account in Mark 13, and it's, it's really short, the four disciples who were there walking with Jesus afterwards, when they, you know, they're all walking out, wow, you know, wow, pastor, that was a great sermon. <laughs> and they're all walking out up the hill and they're going up to the Mount of Olives. It was Peter, James, John, and Andrew. So they left the temple and on the way out and when they're sitting up on the mountain and they're looking at the temple and all its grounds and so forth, they kind of asked questions again and, and it was the same thing that Jesus had already been going over for the last several hours and they're trying to process how that works. So if, if, you, if you look at Matthew 24, I've got here this outline We'll, we'll go ahead and start with verse 1, but in this outline, I'm calling this a threefold question. Some people will say um, the, the disciples asked three questions. And then people who want to be really snarky and technical about it um, because they want to hold you to account with this passage will say, no, they didn't. They asked two questions. Well, they kind of did. One is kind of a semicolon, but there's three parts to it. It's a threefold question. That's why I named it that way. So they want to know, well, when will these things be? When will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus answered these questions in the order that they asked. So what we're going to go over is we're going to see not only did Jesus answer these questions in the order asked, but he would go from the point of answering their question out toward and then the end. And then he'd go on to the next part and say, and then the end. And then he'd answer another part and say, and then the end. And we'll get into this too, but he talks about the end several times. So some people will try to say, no, this is just a, a, a linear timeline. It's, it's, you know, that this happens. This can't happen here because up here it says this. Well, you've got issues because he brings us to the end several times in his narrative. So trying to parse what that looks like and what he's talking about in each little part can be a little bit tricky. And people have, tend to want to butt heads over it, argue over it, fret over it, what have you. So um, I can, if you like, at some point in email or something, I can send this outline to you because it's got all these references and things in here. If, if you, in your own private studies, want to go through and, and kind of, Harmonize the passages when he's kind of, Jesus is answering these questions similarly in the other passages. Um, and it, it might be helpful or it might be more confusing. Um, so some of the things Jesus is going to answer in here, just as an overview, in addition to celestial signs, Jesus describes the earth at that time. Speaking of, of the end and as of the days of Noah, right? And we've heard this before, there's going to be many false Christs, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation. Now, interesting here, the word nation, we tend to think of, especially in the Western world, as nations, we think of like there's the United States, there's Russia, there's Uganda, okay. The word nation in the Greek is ethnos. Does that sound like a word you know? Like ethnicity. So what is happening here is, is you've got nations, nation against nation and you've got kingdom against kingdom. Now kingdoms are more like the different countries. But are we having issues today between different ethnicities? And I, I would argue that like worse than any time that I've ever seen in the past. We, uh, I remember, I'm old enough to remember kind of some of the, the Watts riots in the 60s and what that was like. Um, and we've seen similar among um, Hispanic groups in California. California is just a hotbed for all that kind of 
muck raking and stirring things up or whatever and the racial tensions. But now we're seeing these things globally, right? And I, I think that's going to be the major focus. Well, how is today different than in the past? Because we've always had these things, and it's true. But these things are more global now than they've ever been before. And we could probably attribute that to just generally the evil in the world, right? Um, but also the media has a lot to do with, I mean, when you're, when you're doing a, a YouTube video or you're doing a Snapchat or you're on Twitter or whatever, you're talking to somebody in China, maybe some of it's going to be filtered. You're talking to people in South Africa, in Europe, all over the world. So the world is being, by social media and by movies and television, it's being shrunk. So things happen now on a much more global um, basis than what we've ever seen in the past, right? Would you agree? So there's going to be uh, famines. Famines has to do with hunger. Hunger is still an issue, which is odd in the world we live in now, but some greedy people are, are hoarding some of the wealth. I remember when they did that concert, uh, we have the We Are the World and all that kind of stuff, and they raised all this money and all these musicians. Their hearts were in it, and I believe they were sincere in what they were trying to do, and I forget how many millions of dollars they raised, and, and they went and had all this food shipped overseas. Was it Ethiopia? And warlords got a hold of it before anybody else got a hold of it and they sold it all off and they bought weapons yeah so that next to none got really out to starving people very sad pestilences like covid and other viruses and things and, and germs it's going to be broader than it ever has before and i think we can see that here Earthquakes in various places, and they are more widespread than they used to be. Um, the Ring of Fire, which is if you Pacific Ocean, if you're looking and you trace your finger around the entire Pacific Ocean area between the continents, it's almost like it's unscrewing. <laughs> you know, it's just there's always stuff, volcanoes and earthquakes popping off there. But we're also seeing in, in different places like uh, you know, Oklahoma and places where you don't normally, you know, Ohio. And so you don't get earthquakes out there. What in the world? So they did, and I didn't even feel it. Yeah, I didn't, didn't feel a thing. So, yeah. Birth pains. Um, we discussed birth pains before, and that is just an increase in global type of activity. Um in uh, frequency and also in intensity okay just like real birth pains for a mom persecution persecution of the saints specifically right um that's always been bad for the believers is it worse today than than in the past um i would say by virtue of the population of the world we'd have to say yes it is i don't know if per capita it is or not um it's, it's really hard saying. It seems like the more places in the world where Christianity has been spread, though, persecution is coming up in those areas because the gospel has been spread more bar broadly than um, in, in the past. So where the gospel has been shared and there's believers, there's persecution. So as the gospel spreads, persecution increases. False prophets. Wow. Wow. Yeah, turn on the TV, turn on, um, you know, TBN, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so false prophets aren't necessarily, you know, used to, in the past you used to think of false prophets. You would think of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and Charles Taze Russell and Mary Baker Eddy and all these types of people, Sung Young Moon. But now we've, we don't even need to look outside the church or the church. Yeah. Um, no love, um, lawlessness, and we're certainly seeing that. Lovers of themselves, like we see too in the epistles, right? Uh, this is the selfie generation. And the gospel being preached to the whole world is, is uh, one of the signs of the end. 
And I guess we get that because we, you know, have all this technology that's the downside. Um, it's, it's paying off in a good way, too. And, and then the end. And then the end comes. So those are some of the things we're going to we'll take a look at um, as well. So let's, before we, we get into all of this, the abomination of desolation and all that, yeah. You with that. However, I'm just always, and I should not be, but I'm always shocked at how fast it's going. I mean, I'm watching, you know, don't judge me, but I like to watch the uh, Hallmark movies or the little stories they come out at Christmas time. And, you know, it's whatever. And you get a little bit of the woke in, they have a gay brother, whatever the deal is. Yeah. I watched one the other day, and they had a kid's play. The head guy that was falling in love, his sister was gay, whatever, she had an adopted son, and she was doing his play. Well, it gets to the end, and they're showing the kids play, and Santa's a girl, and then Rudolph got replaced with a unicorn that had a rainbow thing that was all about love, and you, and I'm thinking, this is a kid's play in a Hallmark movie, you know? And I'm, I know there's more to that, but I'm just thinking, it's, it's just insidious, it's everywhere. It's yes, it is. It absolutely is everywhere. Each passing year, I think, well, it can't get any worse than it is now. And then, <laughs> oh, yes, it can. And it does. Well, you're talking, you know, that no love equals lawlessness or whatnot. But, you know, like you said, this was a stuffy generation. Like, people are getting raped and murdered. And, and then people are just doing it on their phones and walking on by. And you're saying, what the, you know, I, I get Hallmark is a, a big deal. But I'm just thinking it's just, it's just everywhere. Kicking, kicking the poo out of somebody laying on the ground and everybody standing on their cell phones? Wow. Sucker punching old people while just walking down the street because that's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. We live in an evil world. Let's take a look at at, at Matthew 24, and what Jesus had to say. We're going to launch into this. And there will certainly be room for more comments and questions. And <clears throat> it's, it's stark reality. So, Okay, so then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, as we said. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Because they were impressed, you know. Wow, have you ever seen such a thing? It was beautiful. And Jesus said to them in verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Let's pause right there for a moment. This is how many people have come to the conclusion, one of the ways that many people have come to the conclusion that the so-called Temple Mount is not where the temple was. For one thing, Solomon's temple, as we know, was, was um, as ordered by God through the prophet, was in the city of David. So you're looking at Temple Mount and down a quarter of a mile down the hill, it's where the city of David is. That's where the temple was. There was on the Temple Mount a Roman garrison up there. There's, a, there's some really cool videos out there. Bob Cornick did a, wrote a really good book, and, but there's video versions as well. And uh, Chuck Missler interviews him at some point, and it's really good. But... Um, Retracing some of that, examining some of that, and the reasons why. But this is one of the reasons why um, it doesn't really fit that the Temple Mount would be it, because Jesus' words that not one stone would be left on top of another. And we also have historians, um, and I don't remember exactly who. It might have been Josephus. Josephus, I'd have to look. Why did I, want, I almost want to say Bocephus there? <laughs> 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 I've been listening to it, yeah. Uh, but Josephus, Josephus said that um, they had accounts 
of because of the temple, so much of it was lined with gold, right? And they would the soldiers like to share in the spoils, so they'd get out there with their spears, and they're pushing stones out, and on the ground even on the ground they're popping the stones up because the gold got so, so hot it melted and ran down into the ground and ran between the bricks. But yet you go to the Temple Mountain, what do you see? A bunch of old ancient stones up there and the wall is still there and everything. So that's kind of contrary to what Jesus said. So the way it got to be understood, just so you know, the way it got to be understood is that was the Temple Mount was when um, the Muslims were run out and they took their last stand in Jerusalem. Uh, everybody was exhausted. Everybody was tired. What I understand is that one of, I don't know if he was, a, he, he was an officer. I don't know that he was a general. Uh, found one of the, the buildings up there on top of the um, mountain, and I guess it's probably where the Dome of the Rock Mosque is now. It's some some building up there, and he got up there and he found some relic, some artifact or something, and got up there and declared that, "Hey, we found the temple. You know, get rallied, everybody, get excited. You know, we've got it," and it it spurred them on to finish up the work they needed to do. And I don't know, a lot of that's anecdotal. I don't know how much of that's true or not. But supposedly, that's where everybody got the idea of, oh, this building, this structure here, this thing that we're up on, this mountain, this is where the temple was. So um, it stuck. And ever since then, it's been the Temple Mount. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't match up the biblical accounts at all. So... I don't know. Now the question invariably comes up. The third temple that's going to be built during the tribulation. The question comes up whether the third temple is going to be on the mount or not. Or is it going to be in the city of David or is it going to be somewhere else? And there's like three different pos potential locations on the temple mount where they could put it. There's a, you know, there's a location that's over the Elkaz fountain there's another more southerly location that way you can leave the dome of the rock up and there's others say no you've got to raise that whole thing and you got to put the temple right there where the dome of the rock is or maybe God will shake it with an earthquake and crush it and they'll just put the temple right there and then other people will argue and get all upset saying well it doesn't matter because your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit and that's not a real temple anyway so blah 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 why do you guys care well the reason why we care and the only reason why I care anyway I'll speak for myself is because the building of the temple means that those end times events are here and about to wrap things up because you've got to have a temple before you can have the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist has got to have a temple to go into, a holy place or the Holy of Holies, to declare himself God. So a temple means we're that much closer to Christ fulfilling all things concerning the end and setting up his kingdom. So that's what I get excited about. I don't get excited about a temple. I don't get I certainly don't get excited about, ooh, let's start the sacrifices again, right? I don't necessarily care about that. But it it just means that we're that much closer to the end of all things and Christ establishing his kingdom. And that's why it's important. So in 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 that regard it doesn't matter if it's on the Temple Mount. It doesn't matter if it's in my backyard. Just bring it, you know, and let's get this thing over with. So um, that's the question about that. So, okay, so not, not one stone will be left on another that shall not be thrown down. And so then in verse 3, see, we're making progress. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, and this, this is the four that we we're talking about, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age. So here Jesus launches into his discourse on, uh, to answer these questions. Inquiring minds want to know. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. 
and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end isn't yet, because uh, ethnicities will rise against ethnicities, right, instead of nations, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Boy, everybody's offended now, right? Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Boy, is that not true? Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay, so there he just got to the end right there in, in verse 14. So that answers one question. So the whole chapter, as you can see, does not happen, like I said, as one linear timeline. Um, as an overview, I want to do something kind of different. And I'm not trying to mess you up. But I want to illustrate some of these points and help you understand the reason why um, I say what I say about the the way the book is laid out because people will argue with me about it. I've got all kinds of notes and things here that are things that I've written and blogged about, whatever, and I articulated it probably better in writing than I would in speech anyway, so especially with my tongue tonight. So uh, I'm going to read some of this to you, and you screech at me, chuck something at me or something to get my attention, but we'll, I'm going to try not to read one big giant swath and make everybody go to sleep while I'm doing it. But, uh, and then stop and we'll, we'll discuss and, and see if at certain pertinent points if there's any questions or comments, okay? So overall, this, this particular article I wrote was about context in Matthew 24 because Part of that came in answer to a question um, some people will try to say um, about context. Well, this comes off chapter 23, and he was talking to the Pharisees there, so this doesn't have anything to do with the church at all. It has nothing to do with us in this time because he's talking to the Jews. Well, my... One of the first things I usually bring up when it comes to people saying that, well, this, this whole thing is talking to the Jews, is, it, boy, you know, you could throw about half the New Testament away if you didn't read anything at all that had, was written to the Jews. Are you saying that none of this is applicable to us at all? I mean, it's kind of crazy. Just because one Jew is writing to other Jews doesn't mean that none of this applies to us. So we'll examine some of that. But anyway, um, there is a persistent argument concerning Jesus' Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Again, it concerns the old saw that this generation, Jesus is referring to, means the first century generation, particularly Jews. And therefore, we can take all of Jesus' discussion about the Great Tribulation, etc., put a nice little bow on it, and consider that entire chapter's prophecy signed, sealed, and delivered. They were done. 70 A.D. Okay. There have been a few excellent articles, blogs, and sermons preached from the Greek how we ought to understand the meaning. So, context. Let's take a look at context. One brother insisted that we should understand the context of Matthew 24 as well um, based upon the context of Matthew 23 and that the one gives us the context for the other, but does it. In a way it does, if one wishes to say that the context is Jerusalem, because both chapters are very much about Jerusalem. Indeed, most of the Bible is about that setting, and as a capstone sermon at the end of Christ's ministry, it's fitting that this sermon should take place in Jerusalem. 
Um, also, chapters 23 and 24 do take place on the same day, so there's that. Similarities are often easily noted, but to be honest with any comparisons, we must also note the differences, for they too can be significant. Okay, so in Matthew 23, Jesus begins in the temple, just like he did in, in Luke, speaking to Jews. Not just any Jews, for the same bunch plotted his death as here, as well as Jesus' disciples. Luke 21 is this setting. Um, by the way, Luke 21 is very much about this era, that temple, and more immediate trouble soon to beset Jerusalem. However, there's an important distinction, distinction that dominates Luke's record of the day and Matthew's. Meantime, Mark in 13 follows Matthew 24 in um, setting only that kind of as a byword, kind of in passing, Mark's version. So, Okay, so context. The location's changed and the audience has changed because now we're on the Mount of Olives. Now, how about the subject matter? Does that change? Jesus just spent several verses castigating the religious elite for their profound hypocrisy. And we know the Pharisees were profoundly hypocritical, right? He leaves, walks up the hill, four of his disciples following him up. They are discussing the temple still, and Jesus does remark on that particular temple and its demise. Jesus takes a seat on the ground, verse 3, as the dis these disciples no doubt marvel at Jesus' words that the temple be destroyed, not one stone left on another. They're naturally curious, so they ask him about it. You know, what do you mean? What's going to happen to make these tear the temple down and not leave one stone on top of another? But their line of questioning is ignorant in that they have never been told about these events and how they knit together with the words of the prophets. We see here and again that the disciples mistakenly think that Jesus is about to make his move and wrest rule from the Romans and take his throne. This happens again a bit later, just as Jesus tries to make them understand that they are not prepared for the eternal kingdom and that he himself must lay down his life before they can even see it. So this confounded them and confused them. They didn't understand. There's also no doubt a heavy dose of denial among the disciples as well. It's all very understandable as they once again find themselves enslaved to yet another nation. Uh, so the net result is they ask Jesus about what they think about these questions. Okay, so about context, uh, um, what can we bring in from context about the former chapter, chapter 23, and the answer is frankly not much. Um, when will all these things be is indeed asked on the hills of a big talk at the temple, and Jesus' remark that it's going to come down. He discusses circumstances around the event all the way up to verses 11 and 12. And I say about because there's a lot of overlap. Um, imagine the stunned and crestfallen looks on their faces by the time Jesus reaches this point. Because he doesn't give them the answer they want because they're looking to take over and they're hoping Jesus is going to go take over and sit on the throne. So... We find out now that by the time we get through verse 14 that we're a few decades later and then the end will come. But that's, we'll get into that at another point. But the second part is about what will be the sign of Christ's coming. So he goes back down toward the beginning again in, in verse 15. And that's part of that outline, okay? So verse 15. Biblical prophecy is about pattern near and far prediction. As an example, and it's the example I already gave earlier about the abomination of desolation and Antiochus, Epiphanes, and so forth. So I won't belabor that. We've already covered it. Therefore, we must conclude that indeed there are near and far, far final predictions, or did Jesus get it wrong? Therefore, to conclude that the sacking of Jerusalem could be only 70 AD and therefore must be taken off the table is a presumption, especially in light of the fact that Jesus himself said 
there would be no time before it or after that's worse. Unless we wish to say that Jesus was in error and didn't see both world wars. So what am I talking about here? I'm going to set that paper aside and let's, let's take a look at Matthew 24 again. Because I'll, I want to stay in there and at the same time I want to keep in context with what's going on and how he does take several attempts at the end. Talking about the end. So verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let, those who, let him who is on the housetop not go down, take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may be not in the winter nor in the Sabbath. For then there will be much or great tribulation. That's where we get the term great tribulation. For then, in verse 21, there shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. So before I go on there, that's what we're looking at as another reason why 70 A.D. can't be the great tribulation that Jesus was talking about, right? Because if there's never been a worse time up to that time and there never will be a time after that that's worse, how can it be 70 A.D. when World War I or World War II was so much worse than 70 A.D., right? So what we're looking at with prophecy, once again, is prophecy is pattern. Yes, 70 A.D. was awful. The, it's known that the, the saints at the time attributed the warnings, particularly in Luke, in Luke's writing, to their escape and their safety during the great sack of 70 A.D. Because they had read the scripture, they read the account, and they knew, oh, this is that, you know, where, hey, when you see being surrounded by mountains and so forth, Head for the hills and don't look back. Well, and that's what they did. What exactly they did. And in many of the surrounding mountains and hills, not just Petra, but in a lot of the hills, there are caves and places up in there. And they went in there and hid and they made it. Well, the unbelieving Jews who hadn't been particularly interested in reading the Gospels, reading Luke's account or whatever, they didn't get that word. So, you know, they were, ultimately they were killed. So, Let's pick up verse 22 and read, read toward the end of, the, end of that. Okay. Uh, Until this time, nor shall ever be, verse 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, for the elect, the elect's sake those days will be shortened. What do you think that means? Ideas? Anything you might have heard in the past? Guesses? But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Do you think the earth will start spinning a little faster or whatever? I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that. That way the time will go by quicker. Jesus, at the end of the tribulation, saying enough, enough of this and stepping down, we were about to be self-annihilated by the time you get into the end of Revelation. You get Armageddon. And you got all the armies of the world gathering together. And all these people with nuclear weapons and so forth. We were on the brink by this point in Revelation of total annihilation. Jesus shortened the days by stepping down before it got to that point and he annihilated some on his own specific ones not everybody um, but for the elect's sake because 
Uh, that wouldn't work out according to the plan. Satan would have liked that because Satan is constantly trying to thwart God's plans, right? Well, what would happen if the whole world was destroyed and, and every man, woman, and child on the earth was destroyed? What would happen to all these millennial prophecies about and a child will be able to sit in a pit with vipers and not be bitten and all these other things that happen that speak about mortals going into the millennium and living on the earth in the millennium at that time while the Messiah sits on his throne. That could never happen because, oops, all the mortals got killed and there's nobody to bring in. So Satan would like to see everything wiped out and everybody wiped out, but for the sake of the elect and for God's divine plan for the prophecy to be fulfilled, he steps down in due season and wraps it all up and prevents all that from happening. So then if someone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. Now, I have a que another question for you. Um... And that's this whole thing about here. False prophets will rise and show you great signs and wonders to deceive. Do you think these will be actual like miracles or do you think they'll be fake or what are your thoughts on some of that? Have you ever thought about that? Well, you think in Egypt that their worshippers of Ra were able to mimic some of the miracles that God did. I mean, yeah. Copy, yeah. I, I think it's it's probably I, I would agree with that, and I, I think it's safe to say that Satan does have some considerable amount of supernatural power. Um, I think it's also likely that by permission God will give him more. You know that. Um, that the deception is God's will, so he allows those things to happen. Yeah. And we also know from reading in Romans that God himself is the one you know, blinding the hearts of, of the Jews at this time. So some things God just, they, he just does it for his purposes. So don't know the, I can't say that it's gospel, what the real answer is there, but there is we do know Satan has some, some supernatural abilities, no doubt, as we've seen um, other angelic beings in the past. And um, he certainly is the great deceiver and trickster, so we know he's capable of doing it. And, and as, as Sarah pointed out, um, you know, with, with the uh, Pharaoh's priests in Moses' day, um, he, he did similar. So, immediately after the tribulation of those days, um, let's look at what happens here again. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Um, what's this? Chapter, verses 29 to 31. And then verse 30, the, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And that's another big way that you know this was in 70 AD, right? Because the sign of the Son of Man did not appear in heaven. <laughs> okay? And I would like to know when the stars fell and the powers of heaven were shaken back in 70 AD and the, and the moon not given its light. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. And what else will happen? They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't think that happened in 70 AD. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So we can wrangle and rest the sign in... Um, about the heavens shaking and stuff like that. But we can't dismiss the rest. 
um, seeing the Son of Man coming in the clouds and so forth. Uh, therefore, again, with context to verse 23, we can honestly say it really has nothing to do, or chapter 23 it really has nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about here. Certainly not 70 AD. And um, you just you just can't relegate it that way and say, no, he's only talking to the Jews and it all has to do with 70 AD. It just doesn't fit. So to demonstrate the other side of this, this is part of what I wanted to get to and all this was leading up to get to here. To demonstrate how this is future in this passage, uh, Jesus explaining the bulk of chapter 24 at about the end and talks about coming... Jesus is coming in the end is mentioned 13 times in this chapter. 13 times. So it can't be about anything else. As indicated, how does it work if in verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world and not until this time nor, nor, nor ever shall be. That can't be about 70 AD. So the lead up is to the great tribulation um, because it's never been so bad. And that just doesn't square up with, with uh, time-wise with uh, World, War, World War II, World War I. So those verses are, uh, if you take a quick look or you want to jot it down, verse 13 refers to the end. Verse 14 mentions the end. Uh, verse 22 says, those days shall be uh, shortened. In other words, it won't go on for another 2,000 years. So if it was 70 AD, that's, that's not exactly what you call those days being shortened. Verse 27, the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 30 talks about the Son of Man coming. Verse 31, <clears throat> angels will gather together his elect, which clearly hasn't happened yet, right? I don't think that happened in 70 AD. Verse 33 um, when you see these things, it's near. Verse 37, um, what's near? The coming of the Son of Man. Verse 39, the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 42, your Lord is coming. Verse 44, the Son of Man is coming. Verse 46, the ma his master when he comes. Verse 50, the master will come on a day, etc. So the pattern is all future. So that's the context I wanted to get with the overall chapter because... Um, it's important, important to get that out of the way to understand that because um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make clear that some of the other belief systems such as all millennialism or whatever that, that believe that all these things took place in 70 AD, you can't get that in Matthew 24 at all. It doesn't fit that model at all, but it does fit pre-trib, pre mill so let's take a look at the, the rest of this here. I'm not sure much, how much further we'll get, but... Um, no, you know what? We'll, we'll get... Actually, reading the chapter, read it. When you get a chance, read it at home. I wanted to look at a couple other things here. This is a, just kind of another way to illustrate all the way through verse 14. So this is kind of in three parts, like I said, because it's a threefold question. Going up chapters or verses 4 to 14 now and in the future so toward the bottom corner there you can see Jesus Peter James John and Andrew they're all together um, we have the cross we got to get through and then we have a diversion where some of the material that Jesus is talking about does take place in 70 AD so it's a double fulfillment and we see this in prophecies a lot just like we did with Antiochus Epiphanes right um, and then we have this age of grace, which we, they didn't really understand, and then Jesus didn't really go into it. He kind of hints at it a little bit with some of the things he says because they're kind of scratching their heads and wondering, well, wait a minute, how does that happen? And then in the future, this great tribulation that's going to be really bad, and then the coming of the Son of Man. So he didn't really talk about that age of grace, the church age that we live in now. Um, that was a, a mystery, and Paul disclosed that mystery much later. So the, there's um, that part, and then the next part that he's going to answer is, um, 
you know, when is the sign of your coming? And that's part we're going to be getting into um, in the next section. And he talks about Daniel's 70th week, or the Great Tribulation, the second half. Which, so that's where a lot of people get confused because he goes, starts off one place, talks about the end, and then he talks about the Great Tribulation, and he goes to the end. And so he, he does this, like I said, about 13 times, mentions the end as it is. So are you confused yet? Or? No, keep trying. Keep trying? Oh. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Is this describing the rapture or the second coming? Matthew 24. Let's let me, let me get a, I want to speak out of turn here. Because I know you're, you're not going to believe this, but I don't have that memorized. <laughs> Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Yep. Then the, okay, let's, let's back up. Let's do the context thing. Um, now, in the MacArthur Study Bible, it has written down the second coming, but let's take a look and see if it really is, okay? Um, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Um, because we know when Jesus comes in the clouds, that's a coming as well, right? He's not all the way to earth, but it's the second coming. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, now here's where we get into the, your question. So obviously, 27, 28 is about the tribulation, because then Jesus in verse 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. We read about that in Joel, right? And the stars will fall down from the heavens and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heavens, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And uh, we read that in one of the epistles, right? And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And those trumpets, from what I understand, that kind of a trumpet will be the um, brass trumpets, which is different from the trump, the last trump, the shofar. Yeah, I think there's three different trumpets that were, would be used. So the but, only reason I was asking is the, the sound of the trumpet and gathering together his elect. Sounds kind of like a rapture passage, but yeah. I'm guessing either when he says from one end of the heavens well, or one end of the sky to the other, then... Here's what here's an interesting thing and that we're going to get into, and I know I've mentioned this before, but um, the Olivet Discourse, Part 1, Matthew 24, where we all now are, but, but the sequel in Chapter 25. Because you've got this gathering um, in Matthew 24. Two men are in a field, working in a field. One's taken, one's left. Um, two people are in a bed, one's taken, one's left. Two women are in a mill. One's taken, one's left. Then you've got, in chapter 25, you've got another gathering happen, but in this case, it's everyone because they're all being gathered together for the judgment of the sheep and the goats. So all the elect are gathered, but all the goats are gathered too. So everyone by the angels are being gathered up and taken to Jerusalem for the sheep and the goats' judgment. Mm -hmm. So if they're the same event, and there, it isn't one's about the second coming and one's about the rapture, we've got a problem because in chapter 24, when one's taken and one's left, how do the ones who are left, how do they get to Jerusalem for the judgment? They'd have to call an my, Uber. My understanding of those, one taken and one left, is that's not a rapture. That's what... It's, it's more of a one's taken in judgment. That's what people, That's the narrative, but then that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. Also, it's... Um, the word for being taken um, has to do with uh, being grasped and taken, snatched away to like to be cared for carefully, not snapped up in judgment. Um, 
but we'll get into that. But again, that's that's the same type of that. That's that's the uh, a traditional view. I think um, MacArthur teaches that view. A lot of people do, and they'll say, "No, there's no rapture in there at all." But like I said, you, between taken in judgment, huh? MacArthur says taken in judgment. Right. Uh, there's also some context for those verses. He's talking about how it's going to be just like the days of Noah. And, you know, there was eating and drinking and marriage and giving in marriage and, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they, meaning the people who didn't enter the ark, did not understand until the flood came and took them. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after that is two men in the field, one's taken, and the other's left. So I think that's probably where the idea of taking the judgment comes from. <coughs> contextually, that's... We'll get, in, we'll get into it, but... Um, Part of the thing with, with the days of, of Noah is that because if they're taken in judgment, then that leaves all the believers behind. Problem with leaving all the believers behind means you're talking about the beginning of the tribulation. And if you've got that at the beginning of the tribulation, then you've got as in the times of Noah, if you want to bring Noah back into it. But the believers were rescued. So, otherwise, if you say they're taken in judgment, you want to say Noah, and it talks about, it's about the end, you've got a problem, because what happened with Noah, and the way he's describing it here, is that it was business as usual. you got people marrying, giving in marriage, life as usual, everybody's happy, it's copacetic, and then sudden destruction. Well, it's not going to be that way at the end of the tribulation. You're not going to have a couple people working in the field. You're going to have people decking and covering, hiding under their beds, maybe. You're not going to have um, women working in a mill. And you're not going to have people getting married and stuff. Because when you look particularly at like the judgments, the bowl judgments, at the end, we've seen all the earthquakes and all the famines and all the things and, and how it's like birth pangs and it builds and builds and builds to the very end. Well, by the time you get to the bowl judgments, you've had 100-pound hail. You've had... Um, all the islands have sunk. All the water has turned to blood. The mountains have been leveled. There's been more major earthquakes. We've got Armageddon going on. So it's not really a party atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And it's not, oh, I didn't see this coming. You know, <laughs> which days of Noah, they didn't see it coming. Right. And then destruction. So understand that destruction is this seven-year period. It's the day of the Lord, and it's not that one particular day. It culminates that one particular day when Jesus comes down and treads out the graves of wrath. So I think it's important to understand that as in the days of Noah talks about commencing at the beginning of the tribulation and not the end. But to say that uh, they were taken, like taken in judgment, um, that type of a thing would be to put it at the end. What Jesus is talking about as in the days of Noah, that's what the end of the tribulation would be like. And I put that at the beginning for those types of reasons. But we'll get into that more. But okay. does that make sense kind of today? Yep. Okay. No, like I said, my, my question originated based on the gathering together of the elect mm -hmm. in 2430, or 31 rather. But 2430 describes the whole world sitting and coming, so I don't think that happens in the rapture. In the rapture, no. <laughs> well, it would be interesting, but yeah. yeah. I'm not even sure the whole world sees us going, or if we just vanish, or what that's even going to look like. Yeah. I'm not even sure we're going to be... Yes, alien I'm not even sure we're going to be instant gone. I, you know, I played with, you know, in my book, I played with just kind of them kind of drifting up like Jesus did and going through the roof and everything and just disappearing. And people going, what in the world? Because that's kind of the, what the angels told the disciples right. when Jesus that's ascended. You yeah, just as, you no, know, that's, that's why he's coming back. Yeah, right. so I don't know what it's, you know, well, the way he left is the way he's coming back. Well, how, how are we going to leave? <laughs> how did the eunuch, you know, that whole story there, how did, you know, so yeah. we'll find out. But I don't think we're necessarily going to be like instantly Medical naked and leave our leave our glasses and our dentures on the ground and our your hearing aids and everything on the ground either you know that's kind of that's the lore of the 20th century right but I don't know it's going to be that way what does it say about the people that don't that aren't Christians do they all, they don't all of a sudden believe do they like what no, do they it's, say? <laughs> I mean, they've been given over you know 
to a delusion, according to the scripture. Yeah. And so they'll believe, you know, all these millions of people were, were taken by uh, aliens, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. mass yeah. alien there's abduction or something. There's a lot of alien stuff going around right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like in movies, there's a clear, like, parallel. So, like, I'm assuming what it's going to be like, you have, uh, all these TV shows where the parallel entire premise is, in the blink of an eye, half the population disappears. Oh, yeah. It's a, a, a That's right. Home. And yeah. Avengers Endgame, the most popular movie of all time, like, uh, in the thing where Thanos. Snaps, <laughs> snaps, snaps, yeah. And everyone disappears. Like, yeah. half the It's like they're setting it up for people. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so, so people will be more like, oh, it was aliens. Yeah. Yeah. That one. This one. I think it's important to, under, to realize that. Um, as, since the scripture has been written, we know that Satan, although foolish, is also very smart. I won't say wise. He's very smart. And he knows better than any of us, or at least as well as us. Probably better. And he's probably got the whole thing memorized, okay? So he's got time, and he'll set things up, and he'll set up this great delusion and things. And um, so he's working his plan trying to thwart God's plans, and of course we know that's going to be a big fail. So um, it's important to realize that when we watch movies and we see these things that kind of forecast what's going on around us, or, ooh, this is just like this movie, or, ooh, didn't they do this in The Simpsons, or whatever, um, Satan's at work, you know, to deceive the world and to set things up. Which is really easy right now, because everyone's being deceived by the weirdest, stupidest things. Yeah. People will believe anything. That was my that... thing for years. Or, you know, when I was little, so I was like, how would they convince anybody it's anything other than the rapture? Yeah. How? But now, I mean, you know, yeah. you see all these stupid Twitter posts, whatever, and you're like, how do you? Yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> like I yeah, even remember. told my friend Eric, who you met, who does not believe. I said, if something ever happens where everybody's got half the people are gone, this is what it is, and you better believe then. Mm -hmm. So I mean. It won't be, see, that's the thing. It won't be half the people. Yeah. It won't be as big as that. Mm -hmm. So you oh, can well, say, all oh, no. 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 So no. You, it'll be, you know, we'll be lucky if it'll be a quarter of the people. Oh. So you got to think, you know, they can go, oh, those people that needed re-education or the aliens yeah. took them and did, oh. I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. not like half the people. No. No. Yeah. A lot of people. It's all those pesky, you know, moralistic Christians, Christians that yeah. disappear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you know, what, is it, what does James say about belief? You know, you say you believe in God, you do well. The demons believe too, and they tremble. So a lot of people believe in God, but they're not believers. Yeah. Or they're not followers in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, the God they believe in is a God made in their own image. Yeah. Frankly, that's most people. My God wouldn't do that. My God wouldn't send a bunch of people to hell. That's not my God. My God is, you know, and it, oh, God looks like what you define now. So yep. it says in Romans 3 that no man seeks after God. Well, unless the Holy Spirit gets in there and adjusts your thinking and adjusts your spiritual insight and everything else, and unless he quickens you because we're all dead in trespasses yeah. and sins, being dead in trespasses and sins means that we're, we're living here in, you know, under the, the shadow of the God that we created in our own image. He behaves the way we think he should behave and would want him to behave and whatever else. So it's... We're all deceived until the Holy Spirit shows us the light, and, and we realize that we're, we've been dead in our trespasses and sins. We need Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins, and that's what it's all about. Um, he demonstrated he's victorious over that by the resurrection, so he's victorious over sin and death. And because he was victorious over sin and death, so too are we. Uh, most people... Um, you know, don't believe the resurrection was real. Jesus was a really great teacher. He was really smart or whatever. Or a lot of so-called Christians today, Jesus is like the big genie. You know, he's here yeah, too. They don't read their Bible. They don't change no. their lives. They go, they hear this big motivational speech, and they're like, we're good. God is love. Self-proclaim. You name it. You claim it. You yeah. Yeah. live your best life now. Live your best life now. And I, I like what I think it was MacArthur said, that if you're living your best life now, like Osteen says, then you're going to hell. For Christians, this should be our worst life now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our best life is yet to come. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Preach. Well, let's wrap it up because we're already like approaching 720, but we will get into that stuff even more. I bet, you know, in your, 
in your um, insight and looking ahead a little bit, you see where it's headed. You kind of go, wait a minute. And that's kind of what we're going to start getting into is try to suss some of that out. Because I think we, like I said, this is why I started off saying that it's legitimate to apply some logic in, in um, our hermeneutic, mm -hmm. you know. So um, that's where I kind of read that and I kind of said, wait a minute, that doesn't, to me, make sense. That talking about as in the days of Noah and the elect, you know, it's about the end of the tribulation. It makes more sense at the beginning because it talks about catching people by surprise and the conditions of the world is business as usual. Everything's yeah. copacetic.